um, today. Delighted to have um, Oliver with us. It's great to have some um, some kind of people speaking from a, a kind of a bigger bigger company point of view. I'll just say a couple of quick bits, and then I'll kind of hand over to Oliver. So Oliver's the technical and innovation group director at Bar Barrett Developments, the UK's largest house builder. Having spoken with William Swan of Energy House 2.0 fame in the in the recent webinar uh, that you did with Simon, um, we were keen to speak with Oliver to learn more about their work with the Energy House uh, and Barrett's mission to reduce carbon emissions kind of going forward through the decade and beyond. So Oliver's also pl played a key role um, within the kind of the future homes hub, which I think Oliver's going to have a chat with us as well. So kind of without further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to uh, Oliver and Oliver can take it away. As always, use the chat box for any questions. We'll let, Ol we'll let Oliver kind of rattle uh, rattle through and, and explain some of the stuff that Barrett's doing. Then uh, we'll get into questions at the end and uh, and hopefully get those answered for you. So Oliver, over to you. Welcome. Brilliant. Thank you, Doug. Can you hear me? Most we can. We can. Excellent. So, yeah, so I just thought I'd go through some of the stuff we've been doing around the sort of framework for building sustainably which is the title i had so i'm just going to cover our roadmap uh, a bit about the z house and the energy house um, um and the e-home too and then a little bit at the end really chat uh, about some of the work we're doing about getting prepared just to give you a feel as, as a major developer the, the approach we've been taking for this i think the important thing uh just as a bit of background is we we deliver around eighteen thousand homes a year uh, we've got anywhere between 350 to 400 sites running at any one time. And we we do build everything from sort of a bungalow to a, you know, a 45, 50 story building. Um, so we, we very much look at all the remits and we are in, I suppose, three uh, countries in England, Wales and Scotland, because there are variances in the regulatory requirements. So uh, hopefully what you see today is how we sort of try and ensure that knowledge um and our approach is as is as is as similar as possible in all those covering all those variances so right so so just as a starter i thought it'd be quite important just just to say that most i mean most companies especially major companies are getting charged with driving sustainability and i think they're doing that one because you know we'll talk a lot about government regulatory changes but two actually it just makes very good business sense to be sustainable and future-proofed and free i think a lot of realizing you've only got to look at the news that that the way we do things and construction takes a major percentage of carbon within you know uk plc it, it's important we play our role so barrett and, and other developers and other companies have set some very clear targets around you know net zero transition to 2040 zero carbon by 2030 um which just just for clarity and i will touch on this the net the zero carbon currently the government government have put out is a, like a 75 to 80 percent this zero carbon would be like a hundred percent of the energy used by the home to move our all our electricity that we use you know as a business on to 100 percent renewables and obviously look at eliminating things like diesel within our fleet and on our sites and then a big push around biodiversity waste and water um because you know the, the, these are sort of targets and, and requirements that, are, that not only are they getting regulated biodiversity get there's a 10 percent regulatory requirement coming in i think it's november uh we went early we went in january we required 10 percent um and obviously waste is just i mean it makes good business sense doesn't it you know to reduce waste because you're actually paying for that product and then just throwing it and then like i said i'll talk a little bit about the z house which touch, touches on the zero carbon targets and then the only other thing i thought you know might be of interest is basically why it's important so if you are um in any way owned by share you know share, if you have shares and, and you, the city are looking at you um and you're over a certain size um a lot of companies are now uh, putting together what they call science-based targets around sustainability, which basically split into three scopes. Um, actually, if you look at us and you look at this diagram, we we're, sadly, we're only one and two, which is a small part of the amount of carbon that's actually used. A lot of it's in, in our suppliers and by our homeowners. But that doesn't mean that we're not going to impact on that. And when we see our direction towards zero, it's taking account of all of that. Um, 
but these, these are the kind of things that are now pushing businesses to to become more sustainable so i thought it was important to sort of give you the high level drivers that plc companies have around sustainability and if i'm honest you know having previously for 10 years been at the bre doing a lot of this kind of sustainability work with marks and spencers and others the important thing is that these sort of science-based targets mean that you, you can't have anybody coming in and just greenwashing. They've got to actually be doing this stuff because it's being measured uh, and monitored. So uh, if I go sort of into the, you know, our roadmap, but more, more sort of regulatory driven, uh, and I'll be concentrating on the future home standard and changes to regulations, LF, uh, o and S, which is basically energy efficiency, ventilation, overheating and, and electric vehicles. So the sort of consultation came back out in 2019, 2020, and it was quite clear that not only would there be a step change in 21, but there'd also be a step change in 25. So in 21, they'd set a 31 percent uh, or concluded on a 31 percent uplift on energy efficiency and including a, and a, overheating and and additional over um, ventilation requirements as well as actually they didn't in the consultation but they post came out and wanted electric vehicle capability throughout uh, our sites so knowing that we built the z house and as i said i'll touch on that later on because we suddenly realized that i, I suppose we've had unprecedented changes um in in regulations um that came in with that consultation and, and other things, in, including you know, some of the fire regulations that have, that have come out and, and since then some acoustic and other work that's been looked at. So we did, you know, to, to understand that, we've done two trial projects. Um, and like I said, I'll touch on those a bit later. So the regulation was released in 2022, which you can, hopefully if you can see my mouse here. Um, and then, we've worked our way through to getting ready for that regulation. I'll talk a little bit about that journey. And then obviously with an eye on that, there is a 75 to 80% requirement. And like I said, we've got our own zero carbon home requirement and then the next zero requirement going through. So a sort of roadmap, which, so this is the regulatory driven side, if you like. And previously I've talked uh, about the more sort of business wide drive around sustainability and carbon. At the end of the day, I'm a builder, so you know I like to try and put things in the in the most simple form. So what I prop what I do is just walk you through what what are the changes going to look like for our customers, who at the end of the day are the heart and of what we do and the most important people because they're the ones that hand over their hard earned cash to buy our homes. So 2013 was probably the last big regulatory change. It was a six percent improvement. And, you know, what we had is all of a sudden air tightness, you know, became important and we had a, a five air tightness, about the size of an A3, slightly bigger piece of paper. Gas boilers and very efficient gas boilers came into play. Radiators stayed, double glazing and a port insulation got introduced to home. So not, not a big step really for, for the industry. If we move over to 2021, which is basically obviously has come in now, but really will come into action as of June this month, 20, um, it's the 22nd of June, this month it actually gets enacted, finalised, um, uh, with transitions taken into account. So with that 2021 regulations, what we've done is increased insulation in your walls, floors um, and roof. Obviously the big introduction is that most homes that we build will have P solar panels, photovoltaics in them. Um, you, we've had to push the air tightness down. We've had to introduce a lot of heat recovery type systems. So wastewater heat recovery, which we've actually used anyway in 2013 for a number of projects, a number of our houses, basically takes the hot water out of the shower and puts it back into the cold water coming in, which means the gas boiler needs less, less gas to heat the water up. So it sort of heats, preheats the water. Um, we've taught electric vehicle points will come in although that's on a site by site basis, whereas the, it's important to note that the rest of these regulations are on a plot by plot basis. And that's slightly because developers, uh, I suppose, push their luck sometimes, some developers, and, and you know, you had sites that's still being built to very old regulations and government were keen that we, we changed to the new, new regulations. Because of the air tightness um, and other aspects, uh, 
we moved to uh, mechanical ventilation. Previously, like in these houses, you would have had trickle vents. Now you have a mechanical, you've got trickle vents plus mechanical ventilation. And because ventilation is key, not only for the energy efficiency, but even more important for overheating. Um, interestingly, we, you know, I think um, there's a big drive around as-built performance. So this is basically the, the theory of, of a, 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 a SAP that you do or what you calculate under part L that you can actually deliver it and, and the two are very close. So what you theoretically say the house performs as, you can do that in actual performance. And in that instance, one of the, the I mean, the government were pushing for us to actually do tests. So sort of like a miles per gallon approach, but that wasn't really fully developed. So what they've done is said, well, in the first instance, they're looking for photographic evidence. So you'll take photos of every house, um, which is geotagged, and you will uh, pull that into a file that's checked by a number of people, but is also handed to the customer to show that you've used the right products in the home. Larger radiators and pipes. So the, the, this current regulation is future proofing for air source heat pumps. So one of the with the, and the way it's doing that is it's, it's the requirement is that you design the house to run at 45 degrees Celsius hot water, which is basically what heat pumps most efficiently work at. But because your water's temperature is lower, the surface area of your radiators has to be bigger, or you can go to underfloor heating or other technologies. But if you lose radiators, you basically will use bigger radiators. Looked at enhanced glazing, so uh, gla you know better thermal value on the glazing, uh, and I've touched on the insulation in the walls. So if you then move through to the future home standard, so now you're at that 75 and 80 percent, which is, you know, that that isn't set in stone. It's just what the government have advised so far. The key there is. You'll probably stick with similar amount of PVs. Your air tightness um, will either remain at four. It might drop to three. That's yet to be discussed. The big introduction is air source heat pump or equivalent low carbon uh, heating system. So it could be ground source. Um, it can be anything. It, it can be direct electric. Um, the reason air source is probably the one that most people are, are currently considering is it's done on a unit by unit basis. It's uh, highly tested in Sweden, Norway, France and other countries that they, they use air source heat pumps quite regularly. Um, and it's it's probably uh, an easier install instead of going to the ground. But I don't I don't you know, nothing's nailed on. I just think that's why people are currently looking at that. Um, the way the air source obviously works is it takes the heat out of the air and puts it into water. And it basically does it through really a reverse process of a refrigerator. Um, sorry if I get, I'm, I'm an engineer, so I, I can get a bit technical sometimes for so my apology. So, but that's why the questions are there, if anything, any clarifications are needed. Wait, waste water heat recovery again, and that's quite a common, that would be common in houses now because it's a very uh, good way of recycling heat from the home. Um, we've talked about electric points. I think the mechanical ventilation may, and you'll sort of see between the two, may move to mechanical vent, mechanical heat recovery ventilation or central systems. So MVHR, is, as it's commonly known, more insulation definitely in the walls will probably move from what is currently 100 mil cavity to 150 mil cavity. Enhanced double glazing, possibly some developers will look at triple. The radiators will stay the same. Um, you look, every house will have to have a cylinder if it's got an air source heat pump, but there are some other options in that uh, around cylinders that integrate air source heat pumps as well, uh, and some innovative uh, cylinders are out there. I mean, we've already seen this previously, but I think smart systems will become even more important. So most people understand sort of Nest Google system, the way the, the house will have to have a bit of a brain because you'll have a lot of technology in there. I think the only thing that's probably missing um, from this requirement, and I don't think it'll come through, is batteries. Uh, I think we'll see probably customers moving towards batteries because the power that the PVs produce, you can't use automatically. Uh, you, you want to use it usually later at night, so you need some sort of storage capacity. And then, as I said, and I think I've covered, as we move to beyond future homes, um, I can see things like underfloor heating instead of radiators coming in. I can see much smarter technologies coming in 
I think we will go down to at least a free air tightness and mechanical ventilation. And as I said, I think batteries, we'll see those starting to come through. So that's hopefully a sort of very simple step by step of what are the technologies we'll see in our homes. So I put this in because as Barrett, when we're looking at technologies uh, that are coming into the homes, and as I said, we're, we, so we know that we're going to put at least, you know, possibly 18,000 innovative, an innovative product will go eight, into 18,000 homes with 18,000 customers. So of course, if it goes wrong, it's also then 18,000 problems. And if it goes wrong after two, three years, it's a very big number. So we have a, a very clear sort of new product introduction process, which I'll touch on in the next slide. But to do that, we've set out our sort of four P's when we're looking at technologies and approaches. Um, so if we just looked at zero carbon, you know, very importantly for us, it, it's very much about people. So if you just look at the, you know, our internal people, so whether they're technical people, our architects, our land people, our commercial people, they won't have... Um, previous knowledge of using a lot of these technologies our trades will also not have that knowledge and our customers most importantly will definitely not have, know how to use them or have been in houses which have had some of these technologies so we we very much and probably most important start with the people and what would be need to be done and would it be of interest to our customers and we then look at the process of designing what can it be maintained how easy is it to build will all our other partners our mortgage lenders our warranty providers be happy with it we look at the capacity, can they deliver 18,000? Do they have the right types of rare source heat pumps mainly developed for the refurbishment market? So they're a little bit too big for what we want because our houses are highly insulated, a very high air tightness um, compared to say a Victorian house. Therefore, we probably don't need the same product. Um, and a lot of times with innovation coming into new pill, we have to just double check it's been certified and it actually performs as it says on the tin. And then I've touched a little bit on as built, but you know, for us, sad, well, sadly, I suppose, probably positively, any technology has to be integrated into the regulations um, so that we can use it. And then, most importantly, we we do do a lot of looking at you know bringing technologies that don't impact building physics. So whether that's condensation or air quality or other aspects of building physics, solar gain everything we look at you have to sort of look at it being in the context of a in a home so i touched on the new product introduction process so most other sectors have this approach um, so it's nothing new but it's obviously very much about if a technology a process a design anything comes into our business we have to take you through this process obviously the simple process of desktop studies you know where you're looking at look what's the uh you know where's it been used before you know is it is it some some is it a, a fag packet idea that they've just come into my office and put forward which sometimes you know are very good ideas but need a hell of a lot more work than if it's actually all the way through and it's being sold out of juices and we just haven't seen it um through to then interviewing and assessing companies then we start trialing uh, and we'll trial sometimes just in a factory or obviously not in a customer's home. And, and I'll talk a bit about the Z house and e-home too, all the way through to actually trialing on a house um, and then all the way through to actually rolling it out across our divisions. So I was going to talk a little bit about the Z house um, and some of the aims and objectives of the Z house just to help you see some of the work that we're doing so so that's the obviously that's the graphical representation of the z house so why did we do it so like i said that the, there was very much this you know we're going to have to improve energy efficiency and get to zero carbon and i was very much that you know whilst we'd done that previously under the code of sustainable homes that was nearly 10 years ago plus what does that look like now what does the supply chain look like now so i mean a classic example would be you know challenge the supply chain because if i'm honest if you talk to my business three four years ago about air source heat pumps or mvhr systems there hadn't been many successful installations where customers were getting the right kind of outcome and there's numerous reasons for that but one of the big reasons was we've had major complaints about the noise of air source heat pumps but in the 10-year period a lot of work had been done by the air source heat pump manufacturers, which meant that actually 
you know, we were able to see today what technologies would be applied. Um, and obviously, the, I've talked a bit about the four P's, as I call it, and the integration of those new technologies. And also looking at solutions, and I'll talk, you'll see, we obviously we, we opened the house and allowed it quite, you know, big innovations to come in or any innovation to come in because it isn't a home that a customer lives in. Although we've had people in it, um, it's not actually a home that we are selling. It's on a university campus at Salford University. And of course, we wanted to make sure they are commercially viable and scalable. So uh, we find that when you build a house with a technology, you soon find out whether it can or can't work. Now, with the Z house, it's it's outside. So we sort of set ourselves uh, the uh, challenge of looking quite a lot of key drivers. So carbon reduction, so that whole sort of, you know, uh, all the way up to, I mean, the Z house is actually beyond uh, zero carbon. It's 125% reduction because of the amount of PV. So it, it's actually energy positive. It's actually producing energy against the regulations. Uh, embodied carbon was critical um because that's becoming more and more important um we uh did a partnership and are in partnered with um our you know with uh, a number of um wildlife organizations which um we get you know we got involved in the project rspb did the garden for example and very much looked at wildlife and of course biodiversity and again i'll touch on some water health and well-being stuff and obviously we built it with our skills uh, and we built it one of our divisions in Manchester. So we actually had the trades that they were using building the home. Um, we had well over 50 partners, some some sort of obvious, whether it's a Bison Precast or Sangaban or Polypipe, those are sort of companies you'd sort of always see. But then some quite new ones because uh, the world's definitely changing. So obviously, you know, Google, Octopus Energy, uh, Nissan for cars and others and you know just to, because all of a sudden the home is becoming you know in, in some ways a, a mini power station um, and I'll explain why. Some of the stuff we looked at so we looked at advanced off-site construction so with this home we, we very much looked at how could we minimize skills so we didn't have a brick layer and that's because you can see in the bottom picture the bricks were made off-site. We didn't have a tiler because these are actually light steel tiles um, and we didn't have a scaffolder for some of the section of the home and uh, we believe we could do the whole home without scaffold going forward now um what you see here is uh, these were timber frame it's a timber frame closed panel system so it's fully insulated the windows are in installed and the cladding so uh, for the top floor, on the ground floor, the cladding wood came afterwards because you, know, you can't connect it to the timber frame and you can see a brick wall coming in. What that obviously helped us um, was two things. It, from a health and safety point, you can see we integrated the PVs on the floor and lifted the roof as one finished unit. Um, and then the other thing is speed of build. So uh, this building took us about 12 weeks to build compared to say 18 for a normal timber frame and as much as 28 for a traditional build. So we looked at low carbon power and heating solutions. So we've talked about photovoltaics. Uh, there's over seven uh, kilowatts of uh, PV panels on there. So which basically delivers 125% of your energy required. The best way I look at explaining that is that basically the, the house on average uh, should deliver an electricity to the customer for five to five to six, maybe five and a half days of the year, uh, and one and a half days of the year it will take it off the grid. And, and the reason for that additional energy needed is because under the regulations, you don't take account of things like TVs and iPads and Xboxes. Um, so actually, the regulation takes account of regulated energy, so hot water, light, things like that unregulated makes up usually another 50%. So you need to hit the 150% to be truly zero carbon operational energy. We did look at a number of batteries. So uh, you'll see two five kilowatt batteries in the roof there. Um, that was very much with Octopus looking at whether the batteries with the PVs doing storage could very much be used by the customer at peak times and therefore reduce the customer's bill even further. Uh, and and with the energy crisis uh, even more critical 
we had a Mitsubishi five kilowatt air source heat pump. We integrated it with three sort of heating solutions. We had underfloor heating, which you can see in the bottom right corner. Uh, we had a skirting board, which is quite innovative heating system, which is this here where the pipes are actually in the skirting board. So it's like a radiator in the skirting board. And then we also include an electric only solution, which was infrared on the ceiling. I'll show you in a minute that did then advance when we looked at the energy home too. So we had over 95 sensors and a kilometre of wiring in the uh, Z house. And we had uh, PIR sensors. We've had people living in it. We've been looking at indoor air quality. We've been looking at overheating because obviously the, um, the home is highly insulated. And when people start living in it, that's great in the winter. But in the summer, obviously, you know, highly insulated buildings can have a risk of overheating. So and, and need ventilation and shading. So there's very much a lot of work around that. Um, and then looking, as I said, at the integration of different technologies. I'll be honest, one of the probably key learnings was that at that time, which is nearly two years ago, the technology, the technologies that we used didn't talk well to each other. They all had their own little bit of software and their own little apps. And everyone felt like, you know, you gain market share by apps. So what what we've done is is we took that learning um, and we applied it to our next project, which was the Energy Home 2, which if you've had Will on, I'm sure he has wax lyrical about it. So I will give you the developer side of it. So this is the building. It's the biggest environmental chamber in the world, or we think it's the biggest because the only other one that might be out there is owned by the American military and you won't find out how big it is. Um, so, um, it's in Salford and it can basically fit four houses in it. Uh, it has two chambers. So um, it's a 16 million pound facility. You can see on the left hand side picture that's that's a before and after picture. So after is our on the right hand side. That is our house that we put there. It can go from minus 20 to 40 degrees Celsius. So it takes account of 90 to 95 percent of Earth's different temperatures and climates obviously for us it, it tests the house against probably well against environments that we will have in 2050 2100 2150 and it does that and it can also apply wind rain snow and solar you can see you know after 16 million pound investment and a few million pounds worth of work from us and our partner Sangaban the one picture that everyone wanted to come and take and be involved in is the one where it snows on the house. So I learned quite quickly that basically everyone's a child, to be honest with you, when it comes to whether they just want it to snow. Um, so we launched it in January and we're now doing a lot of testing and trialing. But I'll, I'll just go into a little bit more detail about it. And, and I'll just stick on the photo a little bit because this, this has been held like this for quite a while now. I always, when I'm doing this, uh, say, with younger people, so kids, I always say, you know, it's interesting that, you know, you know, I mean, it's quite uh, impressive to see sort of icicles coming off the wall. I mean, it'll test, as you'll see, we use a brand new lightweight cladding solution. So these aren't actual bricks that are on this wall. But what it shows is, and with the windows, is how highly insulated the building. It's a world class insulation Again, it's a bit, apologies, going to be a bit technical, but it's a 0.13 U value. So anyone that follows passive, passive house standards, that's 0.15. This is 0.13, so it's even better than passive house. Um, so, as I said, it was actually in partnership with Sangaban, and Sangaban led it. Um, they'd worked with us on the Z house. They wanted to do their own testing, but they wanted the builder to put it together. So we did this together and we called it the E-Home 2. Importantly, both the Z house and this house are just standard houses. They're houses that, you know, both the Z house, we sell over 1,500 of that type of house a year. And this, we sell probably similar numbers, over 1,000. So these are houses that our customers like to live in and, and like to buy. Um, this one here was a free bed detached. The aims are slightly different in that whilst we, you know, we want to take the learnings from the Z house around zero carbon, we couldn't do a lot of the biodiversity wildlife stuff because it's in a chamber. Uh, we wanted to look at new offsite systems, um, but we also wanted to see, you know, take the learning and put in the next generation of 
sort of hot water and heating systems. And then most importantly, like I said before, the technology didn't talk to each other. So we made a big push on having a sort of brain in the home that allowed all the technology to talk to each other. And most importantly, the, the customer got the benefit of that. So some, some of our partners, um, again, you know, some, some slightly different partners and some similar partners. So you'll see there we've got Volkswagen were involved. I'll touch that on that in a minute. Um, locks on, you know, very much a smart technology in the home basis. Um, so a bit of uh, an octopus again, or a partner as well as Ovo. So it's a, again an integration of different sectors and different people uh, helping us. Now, um, when we looked at the technology, um, it was. So we're inside, and whilst we did put PVs on, actually the the energy home too is is a hundred percent energy energy delivered um, compared to the Z house, which is one hundred and twenty five percent. And that was really because we we recognised that actually PVs are most efficient usually on one elevation, um, and if you put them on other elevations, you don't really get payback. So we wanted to see how far we could go with one elevation. Of course, it's quite a simple roof. So it meant you can get a lot of PVs in. Um, I'll talk about the other uh, technologies that come in, in the next slide, hopefully. Yeah. So um, we had advanced, uh, again, some offsite construction systems. Now, if you remember what I said to you, the, the bricks is actually like a rendered brick, which you can probably hopefully see in the bottom picture. So it's only about five millimeters thick compared to 101.5 but if you look at the house um, and the gray brick that they are the same brick now what's the benefit of this similar to the z house when you saw the top part of the z house was hardy plank it's a much lower embodied carbon um, and the way sometimes I, I highlight that is basically you could have bricked the bottom half of the house which is bricked it you you could put two cardboard boxes in the back of your car and those would be the bricks for the whole house whereas if you were to do it in traditional brick you'd need at least a truck and maybe a truck and a half full of loads sort of 28 um packs of bricks would have to be brought to do a whole house like i said um it was highly insulated at 0.13 but so the difference is that this wall is about was about is 350 millimeters wide to get equivalent thermal values with traditional build, you'd need a half a metre wide wall. We also introduced something, metal webbed floor joists. And the reason for that is a lot of the mechanical ventilation, heat recovery systems that are coming in are going to take a lot of room in your floor and your traditional I-beams may not give enough flexibility. Um, we were below two for our air tightness, which we met. And again, I've talked about the lightweight external cladding system. From a... Uh, a mechanical sort of a hot water and a heating solution and renewable point of view. We learned from the Z house, you see there's two systems. We had a, a valiant air source heat pump uh, with uh, their tank, which is here on the left, but we also integrated what we call a hybrid system. So this is actually a dual system. The tank is at the bottom and the air source heat pump, which is only a one kilowatt or 0.89 kilowatt air source heat pump, is actually sat within the unit on top and it delivers all of the hot water. Now, for that system, you can only do hot water. Um, you can't do hot water for heating, so it's only for, for use. So you don't need to integrate infrared. And what we've done for a bit of research, and obviously a lot of people come into us, all of the mirrors in the house are infrared panels, basically. So you hide the infrared behind the mirrors. And we also put in uh, a couple of ventilation systems. So we had the mechanical ventilation heat recovery system, uh, which basically is you know taking hot water out and hot uh, air out of your bathrooms and kitchens and recycling it back in through a heat exchanger, similar to a car radiator back into them. So you're reusing the energy as much as you can. But we also had a second system, which was just a central mechanical ventilation. So you didn't recover the heat. So we've got two systems and basically we've got uh, a way of now testing these systems individually to see how they perform in different weathers. So minus 20, minus 15, minus five, zero and upwards. 
um, and obviously as you go up you then move from heating to cooling and overheating in the process so uh, i mean you know we you know people sometimes are surprised that in in the uk now we are we do have uh, more and more issues with water uh, and scarcity of water in certain locations in in England and well, in the UK. So um, one of the targets we're looking at, and it has the benefit of carbon reduction, is the reduction of water. Um, and you, I mean, you, you you've got a, new developments again hit with things like water neutrality, where um, you basically look to not take any more water off the site than you would have beforehand and manage water. So we've been very much looking at how do you reduce the amount of water our customers use. And currently most, uh, I think the average is about 140 litres per person per day. Um, and we're basically looking to get it to zero. You won't do that because people need water to drink, let alone to use. But uh, really there was this sort of, sort of breaking point at about 110, 105 litres per person per day. And, that was delivered through smaller baths and aerated showers. But we came across an innovation, which you see on the right, for within the leisure industry, where basically we had a, they had a technology that sort of atomized water, which sort of blew bubbles of water. So the air within the, bu within the bubble, the middle is air, the outside is the water, which basically means a 10 litre shower um, actually is using five litre of water. Um, so you could go from 105 to 90 litres per person per day. And that has a massive impact because you're using, you're heating a lot less water, you're transporting a lot less water, you're using a, less, a lot less water. We also put in a smart water technology to help educate our customers on how much water they're using. Um, a lot of people that go around the house don't know how long they're in the shower and how much water they're using. And are surprised that, you know, something like a 15... 16 minute shower will pretty much fill your bath three quarters full. So you might as well have had a bath. So it's that kind of educational bit that we're also looking at, but it also does uh, leak detection. We're also looking at the water used in, in production of the products. So if we looked at uh, monitoring and, and again, we've done exactly the same. We've, we've, we've put monitoring again, over 90 monitors in the system some in the wall, outside the wall. The, the brain that we've put in there can basically turn uh, on and off the hot water so we can pretend people are living in there basically using certain amounts of hot water. We're doing as-built testing. We're looking at overheating. There's uh, The brain has an automation where it can increase the ventilation and drop the curtains um, and, and blinds so that you get shading. So we're gonna see what impact that has. And again, we've got about four or five very innovative technologies in there. The project's uh, also got quite a lot of researchers, so PhD students from Leeds. Uh, we've got another PhD student that's shared between ourselves. I should have said, sorry, that Bellway are also have a house in the same building with us, which we are partnering with them on developing, you know, and testing. Um, we've also sponsored an additional PhD student We've got some other things that are happening sort of around Greater Manchester linked in with the project. So all in all, I think, you know, and, and this, the, the work we're doing here is going to, and, and if you haven't seen, uh, there is a report saying uh, ready for zero that the Future Homes Hub have built, which and the Future Homes Hub is an organisation looking at how we actually implement zero carbon. Um, so a lot of the lessons from Zed House and this project from both ourselves and Bellway and Sangabana going in to the the zero uh, carbon hub and um, future homes hub, sorry. And the the good thing about that is, I think uh, the sector recognises, the industry recognises that we have to do this. I think now the question is how uh, we do it to ensure that we roll it out robustly. Um, we've got eighteen months of work now on this project. And we've had lots of visits. Uh, with the Z House and the Energy Home, we've had over 3,000 visits because the other thing we think is critical is that we sort of open source this information so everyone can learn from it um, and everyone can be part of this journey. You know, we just, in a way, we've sort of built it more so people can test products and learn from it. And so we can all learn off each other because, uh, you know, this unprecedented change could go very wrong if we don't all help each other out. 
on the journey to zero carbon. I think that's it, Doug. I haven't. Cool. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Oliver. I mean, uh, potentially a lot of questions there. So, guys, get your get your questions in. Um, great to see. I, I, um, one of the other, other chaps on the call uh, kind of uh, mirrored my sentiment. It's, it's great to see those um, images of the different houses with the different kind of technologies as they kind of get and get closer and closer to the the um, you know, future home standard and, and, and the end of the decade. It's I think it's quite understandable when, or a lot more understandable for uh, for clients when they see it that way. And it's uh, I haven't seen it presented. I've seen a lot of diagrams in my time, and haven't seen prevented that way uh, presented that way. So that's really really good. Um, I think the question I had, which stuck out of all of that, is we all know that some of these technologies cost cost money, right? Um, and so, do you think? And obviously, developers are, are, are known well for watching the pennies, should we say? So, how how do you think these innovations for the middle of the decade and the end of the decade? How many of them are, are going to are going to add cost to, to projects? And you, what's your kind of gut feel for? I know technology will get cheaper, things will get easier to do when when it all shakes out by the middle of the decade or by the end of the decade as a house builder. What are you expecting as a, as a house builder for that to actually add to the, the cost of delivering a home? Not necessarily selling a home, but actually delivering a home. Is it 1%? Is it 5%? Is it 0%? What, what's your kind of gut feel there? Yeah. So, um, right. So, I think the, I'll start from the top, if you don't mind. If you don't, so, you're right, we do count the pennies. <laughs> um, in, in in the journey of zero carbon, there are well numerous uh, loads of important players. But if you're specifically looking at cost in in development, there are three key players in in it, and well, I suppose four with the customer putting the actual money in. You've you've got a landowner who is selling the land who will have to take a hit on that land. So when they sell, and you'll probably be aware, Doug, when they sell land. You know, loads of hospitals come along and say, like, I will pay you this for the land. And when they're saying that, they're working out what's it going to cost to build. Yeah. yeah. What am I yeah. going to sell it yeah. for? And what profit am I going to make? And that's and the money left over. That's all yeah. I can afford so to pay for land. So, so landowners already are recognizing that they, you know, and, and some of the really good ones uh, that we're working with, Howarth's, the Crown Estates, uh, and people like that, they're, they're already saying, well, we should take a little bit of pain in this journey because we all want to be sustainable. The second big player in, in this is the supply chain. So they, you know, they're going to sell us products and that's where you say volume and that they will drive um, volume. And, and we in there, us and the supply chain, basically are, our job is to make, is to drive efficiency to get that cost as low as possible. Yeah. yeah. It won't go to zero, so I'll tell you <laughs> that now, okay? Yeah. So therefore, whatever's left will get sat onto a customer's. It will increase the cost of a home. Now, yeah. if you look, and I won't quote you Barrett numbers because I just can't do that, sure. but if you look at some of the research out there, the cost of delivering, let's say, the 75 to 80% is anywhere from sort of 12 to 25,000 um, pounds, sorry, 12 to 20,000 pounds for a normal normal thousand square foot house or 100 square meter house so your classic you know three beds type thing anywhere between 12 to twenty thousand. now the reality of it is that's today with people not really knowing and having not done it in the volume uh, i would you know moore's law would expect you know back in the day i used to pay thousand five hundred pounds for a gas boiler i pay probably three to five hundred pounds for a gas boiler now so, I, yeah, I don't think it'll be that big a jump, but there will definitely be a reduction in cost. Yeah. Um, now, what I do say is, let's say uh, two things, the customer's spending five to £10,000 more in their home. If you look, so if you then put that into a mortgage, even at 4%, it's actually quite a low figure every month. And I will bet a lot of money as a developer, that that money would, if they were to buy not a new home, that money uh, would be being spent on an energy bill. Because okay. if you look at energy bills for Victorian houses and some of the older houses, 
they are substantial now. You're thousands of pounds people are paying. And a new home you're paying. So on the, just to give you a feel, the Z house um, is costing £50 a month to run. Yeah. Yeah. So £300 a year-ish, £304, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, my math's probably wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, £300, yeah. About £300 a month to run. And we're looking at two and a half, three thousand pounds for some units. So, so I think, I think, I think, you know, part of that is also educating our customers. So, I think, sorry, I've, I've babbled on. It's, uh, you know, I've, but I, I, I don't think it's as big a deal. Yeah, I mean, it's, I'm not buying the houses. <laughs> I mean, no, I'm not buying that. So, if I'm a customer, I probably would think. But I think it's yeah. important that we've all got to take a bit of pain in this. But there is also some real opportunities in it. I, I was going to say that, you know, it, it's good to hear. Well, I mean, hopefully everybody, um, I say, takes take, takes that hit. It's not just the customer, but we know technology will get cheaper. We've seen what's happened to PV panels over the, over the last decade and particularly the last five years. Um, but, uh, yeah, as I say, you're, you're, you're trading that extra bit of value on the property for bills that are 80% of what they would have been, you know, well, today in, in five years' time. And I think once people appreciate that, then it will it'll soon kind of be forgotten. Um, but yeah, we're, we're running um, we're running on, on uh, close on time. I know mean, we've got a few questions here. It would be remiss of me to only ask my questions and everybody else is on no, the no, so, so Simon Simon's asked about embodied carbon. I mean, we've got the Z house and the NG house too. Have you guys actually crunched the numbers on the embodied um, yeah, yeah. carbon so, and um, related yeah. that to any targets that, that some of the guys on the call would be familiar with? Yeah, so um, we have um, we've done embodied carbon calculations uh, okay. using the RICS methodology for yep. current houses and Z House and uh, Home Two. We are the only, I think, still major developer to support Part Z, which is the embodied carbon regulatory requirement. And what's interesting is whilst your operational energy drops substantially, as you start introducing air source heat pumps for PVs, your embodied goes up. Yep. So there's a bit of a there's a bit of an, a, a, a wrestling match to be had around embodied versus operational, um, but yes, we have got values for all of those, uh, and as I said, that's part of the reason we did the lightweight cladding to see the impact. Yeah, is is that information in the public domain as well? You, you were saying some of this data on the on the, on the homes has been you know is, is is being made available. Is the embodied carbon information available? I'd have to check. It's it's it probably isn't to be honest with you, but okay. uh, but there's a project called AIM CH A I M C H uh, where embodied carbon information is available. Um, okay. And the Z House was part of that project, so you probably find something there. A I M C H. Yeah. A-I-M-C-H. I'll just put that in the chat just in case anybody's interested. Yeah, no A I M C H project. Yeah, there's a website for it. Okay. Um, Shall I, uh, shall I run through the questions for you, Doug, quickly for you by reading? Is it MVHR and Duckworth? And yes. Thermal envelope. Yeah. yeah. So, no, so uh, great question, Alex. It's not because the roof is insulated because usually I didn't have enough room in. So the it's house. a warm roof. Yeah. I had so much technology in the house, I just couldn't sensibly fit the MVHR. <laughs> so, what I did is I actually insulated the roof, made it a warm roof, and then put the MVHR and Duckworth. So, but usually you're very correct. The MVHR and Duckwood would be inside of the thermal envelope. It is in the Z house as well. Oh, thank you, David. I thought I'm glad someone thought it was a good presentation. <laughs> Rob, Rob has asked about the performance gap. Yeah, so um, so we've done we've done quite a lot of work on performance gap and actually tested quite a number of units. And um the the you know i suppose the positive was we didn't see as much performance gap as had been previously shown i think leeds Be- leeds university or leeds beckett actually uh, led the performance gap work um back 10 15 years ago so we didn't see as much gap actually um there but where we did see gaps um you know rob what we were seeing the gaps really was where mistakes have been made so a classic one one of the units uh was a room in the roof and they basically hadn't insulated uh between the stand-up wall within the room and the roof so some really simple places so a bit i i and i'm i speak as oliver not now now not as barrett but as oliver i think as built performance in the right context i don't over egg it 
to start slow is a good thing because I think you pick up where simple mistakes get made. I, I deal with this all the time where, you know, human nature, someone forgets to do something as soon as you've done it, they don't have an issue. Um, so the the, the um, that leads me on to a question that I had and we haven't got much time so if you've got a last last minute question do post it I, you know the thing that the thing that always always bugs me and, and it's a massive question in the sector for the next you know three five seven years into the decade is skills you know skills to bring these houses to bear I mean MMC is great and it's great you know having a crane driver and somebody that can put the panels in place and having that quality construction off-site um, but in your opinion, you know, kind of what has, you know, net when, when all said and done, what has to happen with the skills that you haven't got a bricklayer, might not have a, a, a plumber and, and, and those other kind of things in, in, in the way that we understand them at the moment. What, what has to what has to happen with the skills of people building homes and how do we how do we really ensure they're delivered well? Because, again, house builders have not got a great reputation for quality um, delivery. So either speaking as Oliver or Bob of Barrett Homes. How, how 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 do you th what what would you say to kind of people on the call, on the call about the, the skill set of people delivering homes? Yeah, so so uh, there's a real danger that in skills, uh, and it'll link to Alex's question around air tightness. You know, that we're, we're definitely not. You know, the skill set isn't as high now as it was ten years ago, and then it wasn't as high as it was ten years before. Yeah, yeah. You go back now. Um, the good thing, and it you know, is that the technology is can help reduce the skill requirements or change. I think the skill requirement, not mm. reduce it. I think change it, and that's where things like MMC and some of these are. I mean, the, you know, the air source heat pump looks really complex, but it's basically two pipes that go into it, and it's done because all of the hard work's done in a factory. If I'm honest with you, yeah, yeah. Uh, the same with the tank; it's all pre-plumbed. So. Yeah, you know, the average age of bricklayers is 47 years old. They say, uh, you you know, I hear varying numbers, 45, but it's it's pretty old. You know, we can't keep going on. Same for plumbers and electricians. So um, whilst we drive our apprenticeship schemes for our subcontractors, um, I think, yeah, it's what you say, that we're looking at different approaches that we can take, Doug, to, to help change the skill set needed. Uh, whilst also pushing it I think um, I think you know well I think it's been raised you know and you know where where there are some and as with all these things there are some developers that have let the side down with quality that back in the where you may may that may not have been seen or heard now with Twitter and yeah linkedin and whatever whatever there's no place to hide and the city are really critical about it so if you look even you know i'd say the problems we were having four or five years ago is those developers you look at what they're doing now they're just they've completely picked their game up because they yeah. got to don't get me wrong everyone will be able to show me a, a unit you know or I can, you know i can go into you can't deliver eighteen thousand yeah. buildings and not make a few mistakes along yeah the way. and you but our you know what i'm proud of is we always go and fix them that's what we need to yeah. do so that that's the key and and learn from them and continue to improve but i can i look in every sector i've worked in automotive aeronautical all of the industries they all make mistakes not too many on airplanes thank god uh, <laughs> so, but the principle is that you know there's a lot of mistakes made and you've just got to we as an industry and you've only got to look at fire and other things you know the industry's just got to get better hasn't it and, and i think skills and managing those skills and approach uh information and managing information you look at this whole you know revit digital twins and all that stuff i think there is a real opportunity probably sadly i'll have been retired but for the next generation to, to really have the tools to enable them to deliver you know continue to deliver i should say ever better quality and more improved homes i mean i think there'll be a there'll be a we're out of time but there'll be a heavy obligation to show how these houses are performing it's one thing saying we're going to be renewable this we're going to be renewable that they're going to be net zero carbon but there'll be there'll be more and more of a requirement from customers owners you know kind of purchasers to to actually show the homes actually do do deliver and that that's kind of coming like a steam train down the down the road as well um sadly guys we are out of time thank you all for your um all for your questions uh, again a huge thank you to um oliver for sharing what the what the house and um, what, what barrett's are doing i think it is 
even for me personally, it's really refreshing that you've invested this money and, you know, you've got 18 months worth of data and, and you know, you, you talked about Bellway, hopefully a lot of other house builders are, are following the same kind of, uh, you know, same, same kind of path to, to remain relevant, but um, great, great for that bit of insight. I really appreciate that, Oliver. Thank you very much indeed. I'm nice to meet you, Ron. All right. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Take care, guys. Until next one. Bye-bye.